Telecom. This is awesome. Thank you for coming to the second meeting of the Computer Science Club. That's very fun to be doing these. It's, it's a real, I think it's a real rush to get ready for these things and then, and then do them. Really kind of focus on learning something and moreover learn how to present it better. So first off, thanks to RevUnit for allowing us to use the space and providing the food and the beverages and so forth. I wanted to take a brief second and say why I wanted to start a club like this. At the time, though there's a lot of new clubs, the data science related clubs and so forth nowadays, but a few months ago there were mostly clubs having to do with programming and specific to languages. And I thought it would be really uh, fun and interesting to have a club that was more focused on looking at things that you might program somewhat agnostic of language. Of course, usually there would be a language being used to show how something was done or because it's your favorite language or whatever, but uh, it would be nice to expand the community to give more options for things like this where you could talk more about complexity of algorithms or whatever rather than language features. And it kind of helps build the community and it's good for practicing presenting, especially on somewhat technical topics. So. Uh, I'd also like to say a lot of the inspiration for having an interest in doing an information theory presentation is from Adam's ID3 presentation a few months ago. I thought that would be that was a nice presentation. I thought it'd be kind of fun to backfill some of the some of the things leading up to it. And I'd like to introduce Tyler, who's 10, and he's starting to write some Ruby code. So we're uh, kind of trying to facilitate that. And I think this group and all the groups really are a great place for younger people to come so they can start being part of the community. Uh, the way I've sort of put this presentation together is sort of a three pass kind of approach. First, a historical narrative and then a little bit of in more information more on the sort of mathier parts and then look at some sort of random code that I put together to present some of the ideas. So historically you would probably say that information theory began in or about 1928, which is an interesting year for a paper to come out having to do with this topic. It was the first year that there was an actual public television station, and people in engineering had progressed past this golden era that everything transmitted was radio, and they were moving on to television. And television had a significantly higher amount of information content, and people were becoming much more interested in learning about how to encode signals and how you could pack as much information into a transmitted signal as possible. And a great engineer at the time, Ralph Hartley, kind of led the pack, I suppose, in suggesting this idea that would turn into information theory. He was looking at signals, how you could describe a signal as far as how many values would be resolvable by looking at signal to noise and that sort of thing. And what rate of transmission you would have. And the problems they had then are very similar to the problems we have now. You want to pack as much information as you can into a signal. One, because you want more information, but also for other reasons like reducing the power to transmit it and so forth. So he came up with the basic idea, or he described the basic idea that we now know as entropy for a signal, and did a lot of uh, preliminary research on uh, what we would now call the channel capacity and noise. 20 years later, it seems to me like a somewhat large gap, but it was 1948 when Claude Shannon at Bell Labs really took these ideas and brought them forward. And he expanded on Hartley's ideas with a much more formal definition of what the entropy was. He pretty much took the ideas from, that came from an electrical engineer thinking about how you would Talk, start talking about encoding signals for television and applying a little bit more math and statistics to it. And some of the things that he was very interested in were how the information relates between what you send from a sender and what you receive when you're a receiver. And this relates to the channel capacity and the noise on the channel and so forth. But today, and pretty much entirely because of Shannon's work, which was if there was ever somebody who took an idea like he did from Hartley and just absolutely ran with it to the point where there's almost nothing else to do, Shannon and information theory is that story. And the 
thing, the areas that you might use information theory in today would be some of the classics, how you would encode information for transmission and communications, but also some aspects of validation and integrity, like CRC checks and hashes and so forth. The cryptography having to do probably mostly with assessing some uh, measures of fitness of random number generators or pseudo random, no, uh, pseudo -random number generators. Uh, machine learning to some degree, at least with information gain and decision trees. And uh, people in linguistics use some of the notions from information theory to describe things about language. Although that's probably one of the harder ones, as we'll see a little while later. And even uh, fields you might not even think of. When you're thinking of neurobiology, there's obviously information being stored, transferred, transmitted in some form or fashion. The encoding is significantly different than, say, shortwave radio, but the ideas from information theory are nonetheless rather sound. So it's really fairly universal. You can use some of these ideas in a lot of places. So with Hartley, just sort of trying to go for motivating examples of why you might be interested in this sort of thing. Harley was thinking about analog signals for communication. So he was interested, if you're talking about radio, you're probably interested in signal to noise uh, auditory intelligibility, but also like the picture quality for uh, television and so forth. So starting to think about how there's some notion of symbols there would be for a discrete, if you sample the signal in a discrete period of time and you wonder about the information, you could think about how many values it could take on. So how many symbols it has for that signal. And that relates entirely to the signal to noise and what the bounds of that signal are. And you could also think about the alphabet, say just lowercase a through z, it's a collection of symbols. And we know, obviously, I'm speaking, or you can read something that's written, there's information being conveyed there, and you're choosing a sequence of symbols that have a certain number of values they can take on. One thing I would like to say generally with information theory is it's a, basically it's statistics. So it's generally fairly descriptive and not prescriptive. You're going to have something that's a signal that you want to analyze and you'll be able to say, make a claim about that signal by because you're looking at the statistics that happen to be information theoretic, but you're not really being able to prescribe how something might work. So there are some things that are, it, it's, it's a good thing to keep that in mind, that it's descriptive. It's also a stationary process, which is one of the reasons why linguistics is probably the most suffering one of these uh, uh, examples. If I'm saying something, will I say five words in generally depends on what I said beforehand. But in reality, the uh, information series is a stationary process that doesn't have temporal dependency. So you're just looking at a cohort of symbols, not how they're ordered. Or you could think of it, you're really looking at combinatorics and you're not really looking at some sort of time series data. So really the biggest basic idea in uh, information theory is talking about entropy. So I'll start off with Hartley since he's the one that um, really started this field and do it sort of as a guided thought process. So you're thinking how would you, I mean entropy is a measure of the information. How would you measure information? If I am speaking to you for a minute then you could say I transferred from me to you a certain quantity of information. And if I was blabbering on for two minutes, I think the natural thought would be you, could, you would be expressing twice the amount of information. But the things that I have that I'm using, words or if it was printed, uh, characters or whatever, the combinations, if I double the amount that I'm using, is not just twice it, it's the square of it, supposing they're uniformly distributed, the same symbols and whatnot. So the basic way to measure this information is to find some function where if I take the function to a power, because the symbols in doubling it were squared, gives me twice the amount of information as my measure. So for any alpha, f of the 
number of symbols to that <coughs> alpha is alpha times the function that I want to choose of the uh, number of symbols. And that's just the logarithm. For every alpha and symbol choice that we have, it's just the logarithm. So Hartley made that observation because he was looking at thinking about electrical signals for communication and he would say, oh, this can take on, I know what the noise is that I'm working with and I know what the excursions this, this signal could take on are. So I know that I very resolutely have 100 different values that I could actually claim to be able to produce. And I can do this reliably because some assertion he has about the noise and the signal. So because of that, he wondered, well, how much information is there that's really being conveyed? And because he decided to take this approach of thinking about it like symbols and being able to find a function, the log function that works for that, he was able to write down, not really sure, this is interesting, H is usually used for entropy. And in Hartley's original text, he uses H. I'm not sure why he does, but the reason why Shannon does is a nod to Hartley. So basically, if you have S symbols, I'm going to use S for the number of symbols. If you have S symbols, you can just write the entropy as some constant beta times log of S, where beta sort of depends kind of historically on what base the log is. Back in the day, they might have cho chosen various random bases depending on what they wanted to use, maybe natural log, but today generally we use base too, so everything's usually in bits now. But if you want to use natural log, you can use the nit, which is kind of a funny sounding, funny sounding thing. Anyway, so the thing that Shannon did first whenever uh, he started working on this stuff was he noticed that basically this means that the symbols are uniformly distributed. So he was thinking about his stats class, I suppose. And he thought, well, that's kind of funny. Why are we thinking that symbols are uniformly distributed? If, say you, if, if you were thinking about the alphabet A through Z, and you were to uh, think about the entropy of it, but you were only using the letters A through M, you're not ever using N through Z. Then why would you have the same fa uh, result for the entropy as if you were actually using all the symbols? Of course, that's very valid. Why indeed would you be doing that? You probably wouldn't. So the idea is that you'd want to weight the symbols and find the expected value of the entropy, not so much what uh, Hartley was doing with the simple approach with the uniformly distributed symbols. So what we usually use would be writing what negative the sum of the probability of some something happening, which would be probability of the symbol times the log of the probability of the symbol. That's just the weighted log, or the weighted average of the things to get the expected value. And so you kind of wonder, well, are these actually the same? Well, if you had, if you had n symbols, you would be doing a sum over n things times 1 over n, because each one would be uniformly or the distribution is uniform, so the likelihood of each one happening is just 1 over n times the log of 1 over n. The sum gets out of there because it's a constant. And then you get negative log of n, well, log of, I mean, negative log of 1 over n. Well, log of 1 over n is just log of n, negative log of n. So this is just log of n. So barring the constant that we had beta from um, Hartley, that's the same thing if they're uniformly distributed. And so what he was doing is he's simply saying, that's not the whole story. We really want the expected value, and we want the thing to be uh, something where you can weight each symbol by the frequency that you see it in real life. So a few other quick things that are handy to, to have. Once we get into using expected value, and we're thinking about this as a statistics problem, whoops, you, uh, you end up with all sorts of exciting stuff. There's no reason to have just one variable. You can have bivariate or multivariate uh, distributions. So if you wanted to have an entropy of a function of two variables, 
there's not any good reason why you couldn't do that. You just write it as a the same general form with two variables. If you wanted to condition it on one of the variables, you can write a conditional entropy like sort of statistical analysis with conditioning and so forth that you want. And I think what Shannon, Shannon started looking at this sort of idea, and then he discovered that there's another statistic that you could calculate that is probably more informative than things like the, uh, like the conditional entropy. And that's the mutual information. And the mutual information generally is given as I for information. But well, it's interesting because almost all of these things have almost exactly the same general form. So you're looking at expressions that are all very similar. So what this guy is really doing is he's calculating, he's doing something like the conditional entropy, except he's conditioning it on the two marginal distributions of P of X, Y. And what that gives you is a measure of something having to do with uh, what is common about information with the two marginals. And another way you can write this, you can, write, you can do this something similar for the conditional one, but what's kind of fun about this is you can write it in terms of the marginal entropies and the joint entropy. And it's what we'll find here in a minute is it's amazingly, blissfully simple to compute a lot of these entropies if you know all the probabilities of the symbols. So this, in Shannon's canon of work, this is probably one of the bigger results. This and work on the noisy channel and channel capacity, but a lot of it hinges on the mutual information. When we talk about things more having to do with uh, decision trees, a notion of information gain becomes probably what's most important. And what seems to me to be kind of interesting is that there's a very formal definition for information gain called the kolak leigler divergence. But a lot of times in practice, information gain is not computed using this sort of method. It's more of an ad hoc method. But just to be sort of uh, any topic. <coughs> what is the motivation for uh, mutual information? The motivation? Yeah. I would think originally the a lot of the motivation for it is studies of um, uh, studies of commonality between the transmitter and receiver. I mean, I don't. Shannon doesn't really write too much about the motivation. It doesn't seem more than like just really getting in there and talking about what it is fairly expediently, but um, the bulk of his work had to do, I would say, I mean, other than really taking, going in the direction of using expected value and so forth for entropy, it was mostly going towards how do we really identify what the maximum channel capacity is and things having to do with the channel noise. And the mutual information, if you assume you have some information or a probability a distribution that's known to the sender and a distribution that's known to the receiver. The mutual information gives you a good starting point for looking at ratios of, say, mutual information to what was known to the um, sender in order to quantify something about the noisy channels, signal to noise, or uh, channel capacity. This information gained the kolbach liebler I'm going to write it just because it's, it's amusing to me how many of these things look very similar when you write it out. So divergence D, and we'll just do a single uh, variable one. Negative sum over X of the probability of X times the log of P of X over sum Q of X. So instead of how we were doing before, where there's, say, a P of X, Y, a P of X, and a P of Y, where it's marginals, where you're using the same distribution P, 
over the data. The only real meaningful difference is that the divergence conditions on using a different distribution Q. So if you have some uh, distribution of uh, symbols P and some distribution of symbols Q, formally the divergence in this sense is the conditioning of the two uh, distributions. And one thing that this has not going for it that the other ones do have going for it is it's not commutative. If you have P and Q backwards, they are not necessarily the same value. But uh, in practice, oh, that's interesting. The page printed blank. Well, I know what was on that page. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so that was hopefully like maybe TMI, but the major thoughts are like, you're starting just, it's amazing, because you're starting and you're just thinking, here's a symbol or here's some letters, and at the end of the day, you're like looking at some stats and doing expected values on them and counting these symbols, and all of a sudden you have this enormous collection of things you could do with this stuff, where you're just computing things uh, based on the symbols that you have and what probability they have of occurrence, and you can think of it like, the information that I have here versus here, I had some collection or probability of these events happening in this one. So there's a gain in information. And one way of thinking of information is, is disorder versus order. If you have a lot of information, in order to have a lot of information, generally a signal looks very disorderly. If I have some signal, for example, and it's like a flat line, there's not a whole lot going on there, and the entropy for a signal like that is zero because you have a bunch of instances potentially of the exact same thing. And there's just nothing happening. What you need in order to have uh, a lot of information packed into a signal is basically you need to you get make the stuff uniformly distributed. That's not because I was drawing sawtooths, but it needs to be as close to noise looking as possible. So. A really kind of fun example of how that plays out in real life is back in the day with your 56k modem. Your 56k modem did not make nice little beeps, but the way it got to be 56 kilobaud instead of like 1200 baud is because the signal was encoded in such a way that it maximized the amount of information that it could put on that channel, and the way that that would happen would be to make it as much like noise as possible. So when uh, 56k modem is talking to another one, it sounds fairly well like just noise, static noise. Not entirely, but pretty close to it. And that's the sort of thing that Shannon, well, in 1948, he probably weren't thinking about modems, but he was thinking about those kind of encodings. How can I take information and get it across this channel and make it as, uh, you know, make the channel capacity as high as possible? Do, does if uh, you want to increase the entropy to enable more data throughput, does that negatively affect like attenuation on the wires? It depends on how it's how it's done. Yeah, in those sorts of circumstances, usually, if if it was a physical signal like a modem, you would be thinking about it. There's some there's some band where you'll have reasonable and pass characteristics. And on a physical modem, I don't remember exactly what the telephone line passes, but it's something like maybe 20 hertz to four kilohertz ish, something like that. I mean, historically it was made to pass intelligible voice communication. Even in the day of the modem, it's intelligible voice communication. So every bit of information that you have, you're trying to package up into something that actually would work well with the medium you're transmitting it through. So the 56K modem probably is more like pink noise, I guess, instead of white noise, because it's band pass limited. But Well, like, if, you, if you're dealing with, if it's as random as possible, then you'll get these blips where it's as high as it can be and low as it can be, right? Do they have to try and smooth those out so that they don't go as far apart from each other? Try and stay closer? Let the ranges go up and down a little slower? It could do that. Um, there's a bazillion different kinds of encodings. It's 
what's really fascinating, not to get off that topic, but what's kind of fascinating to me is how many encodings have been created in the history of the world before there was any sort of thought process that went into this. Like back in the day with radio, like frequency shift keying and so forth, there was no concept of information shift theory that went into any of that. But yet people were being very clever and so they were learning how you can get all this information into a signal and maximize or attempt to maximize what you could transmit. And so there's been ad hoc methods for doing that for forever. I mean, today we'd probably use the term more like you're doing some sort of hashing operation or something like that, some sort of recoverable hash, which I suppose is not really a valid choice of words. But I mean, a hash generally would take some arbitrary signal symbols and turn them into something that's as close to uniform distribution as possible. So if you have some sort of hashing mechanism that can be recovered, that's probably your best bet. I think 56K modems are a really good example of that. That scheme for encoding on that does a very good job at turning data like an email or whatever into something that sounds pretty close to noise. This is a major trick, using one computer on one display with a mouse on another display. So I don't know about everybody else, but I think coding.com is a really awesome tool. And a lot of the things like it. It's really neat that you can just sort of have a VM log into some website and do that sort of stuff. Not that there's not a dozen other services that are pretty similar, but it's really neat. So I seem to use it fairly extensively anymore because you can take it with you on a Chromebook and you would have to have a much fancier computer otherwise. So the code they got written was basically to try to show off some of these things. And more than that, it was kind of meant to show off. Hello, mouse. It was kind of meant to show off how cheesy some of this stuff actually is to implement. Not so much the uh, um, decision tree stuff, but the uh, a lot of the information theory stuff is like wildly silly to implement. So decided to do it in great part to uh, make it more approachable for Tyler, but decided to do it in Ruby. And uh, so there's a couple files that I'd like to look at before we run anything. One being this information theory one. So like basically all these are one-liners. I decided just for convenience for here, that it might be kind of handy if a person wanted to print something out to have hashes that map symbols to the probability of them. So the only thing that really makes that not a one-liner is the thing that will squash the hash to the values. But computing the entropy is just summing or reducing an array, summing the values up based on the value times the log of the value, and then to kind of make it a little more compact instead of doing negative the uh, sum divided by log two, I just did divide by log half. And then you can write the entropy or the joint entropy for discrete sets is actually kind of dumb because you could always, for some sort of countable number of entries, x and y, you could always write some function that will map x, y to some linear thing, which is the same as flattening it. So as long as we're not talking about continuous variables, we're just fine by flattening the two-dimensional array. And then to compute conditional entropy, which didn't really write the short form of it, and mutual information, so just one liner is evaluating the other stuff. For some of this, uh, for some of the stuff that gets done, there's a function that takes an array of symbols and makes a probability hash. 
and then this other stuff is basically like for this, there's like an example having to do with text. So with stripping characters out of some text and or looking at the words or whatever. So that's mostly text processing functions. And then well, we might not really need to look at it quite yet, but I made one additional one that's sort of relevant since we're going to look at marginal probabilities. And it's taking a joint probability array, which is a nested array, and making it into the marginal. So there's a marginal for x's and marginal for y's. And basically the same thing, except one of them is transposed before it does the operation. And I really liked it because a lot of the stuff is basically one-liners. So we go into the examples. First thing I want to is look at what they are. Just kidding. I wanted so I wanted to look at first a couple random number generators. So a random number generator is something that's a kind of fun thing to look at from an information theory perspective because you might be interested, I don't know how to be kind, if the random number generator is good or if it sucks. So back in the day on the IBM 360, there was an infamously terrible random number generator called Randu. And uh, for reasons pretty obvious, it's not something that's bundled up with almost anything that would be a standard library these days. So I implemented it. But we'll compare Randu seeded with the value 321 with the regular random library SRAND. And just for fun, we're going to take the values mod 256 so that like a high score would be 8 for 8 bit. I mean, it would be, you'd have 8 bits of information. Now, if a random number generator kind of was terrible and it only gave you two values, when you're looking at the weighted distribution, you're not going to get an 8 bit out of it, you're going to get 1 bit out of it if you only took it on two values. So, a way to compare how well a random number generator computes random numbers or how well distributed the result is, is to look at it from an information theoretic perspective. So, we can run and on first guy, the one from random library, that's pretty good. There's 10,000 numbers generated and it was pretty close to being uniformly distributed because it, for the numbers we took mod 256, we get almost 8 out of it. Whereas Randio, interestingly, gives exactly 6, which is kind of fun because you can like print out the numbers and it produces exactly 6 to 4 numbers. So that's not a very good random number generator, even in this uh, example. It's only producing 64 out of the possible 256 numbers that we have for the mod 256 thing. So if you're interested in, like, uh, I don't know, if you're doing some sort of problem, like uh, maybe you're trying to compute the area of some weird shape by using some sort of uh, random method and you decide to choose RANDU, it's probably not a real good fit for that because it's not very good at producing uniformly distributed random numbers. It's also probably not a realistic concern these days unless you're running something on the IBM 360. Um, the next thing, I was wanting to look at hashes. So, one thing to keep in mind is some sort of statement about how something works based on information theory is not like a complete picture of anything about it. It's a picture of how the symbols that are there are distributed. So if you look at two hashes, one being MD5 and one being SHA256, one would be probably said to be a better hash from a cryptographic standpoint than the other. So you might think, well, Maybe that means the MD5 is not as good at hashing in the sense that it does not turn incoming information into a well-distributed output. And in that way, a person would be oops, a person would be kind of wrong because uh, 
what I did with that is took the digest, which is uh, hecked, and so a really perfect score would be a 4.0. If you had a 4.0, you'd have exactly the same number of every one of the uh, hex values. But over this cohort of running MD5 and SHA256, SHA they're both really good, and they're both really close to 4. So both of them are very good at taking some input and producing something that's very well distributed. But on the flip side, SHJ256 is better at producing it in a way that you couldn't recover it later. So it's a better cryptographic cache, but information theory is not going to tell you anything about that. It's only going to tell you about how good it is at hashing up the information. So does that like, refer to uh, uh, patterns you might be able to find in different data that would come through? So? Well, it has a lot to do with the stationary aspect of it. Because the uh, you could find patterns in if you were good and you weren't somebody like me and you really like applied yourself to cryptography things. I suppose you could find patterns in how MD5 versus SH SH that is tough. SHA256 were to produce the hashes, but a lot of that is things that are outside the scope of what information theory would be telling you. You're looking at only, here's some symbols, how frequently did they occur? Whereas if you were really wanting to analyze it for cryptographic reasons, you'd want to take a collection of inputs and see what the outputs were. And it's not a, not a stationary process really doing that. What was next? What was next was going to be, oh, text probably. Text is kind of fun. So, uh, in a different directory, I have Kafka's Metamorphosis, the text from uh, Project Gutenberg, the full story. And first off, just want to see like what the probabilities of all the letters are. So everything in there is downcased, and if you're a space or punctuation or whatever, you're rejected from this. It's just the, the A to Z kind of letters. A to Z lowercase text. First off, it seems really fun that you can compute stuff like this. It's just interesting. And you could like see if your Scrabble board was based off metamorphosis or not, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, so this kind of, I mean, this is sort of why the information theory uh, Ruby code was made to handle the hashes so that you could print stuff like this. And this is just sort of for GWIS. Like in that story, how often did the things happen? But we know here, we're not going to, if you were going to make an assertion about what the information capacity is, these are far from uniformly distributed. It's not just log base 2 of 26 for the 26 letters, because Z only occurs 0.02% of the time, whereas E occurs over more than 1 in 8 of the characters are in E. So we know what the distribution is. If we wanted to look at some of the things that you could do with it, you could, um, based on characters, I think this is kind of interesting and it really hits, there's a lot of interesting salient points here because English language or any language is fairly complicated. What came before matters. Big questions like, are proper names capitalized? Does that matter? I don't know. I mean, if you were reading something in all lowercase, would you not know which ones were the proper names? Probably most of the time you would. But you would definitely need to know the historical perspective of it. You can't chop a sentence off in the middle and really know what the meaning is without the first part. So analyzing text by information theory is probably one of the worst things you could try doing with it. But it's still interesting nonetheless. So on a character basis, just A to Z, the average character conveys 4.1 bits of information, which is kind of, I don't know. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting, but I have no real baseline for why I think that. It's sort of gee whiz interesting. If you do it with the word, so instead of using A to Z, you look at 
make a hash with every one of the words that happens and then the probability of their occurrence. Interestingly, the words have 8.6 bits of information apiece. So that's kind of interesting and sort of confirms that words have more information than single characters, but beyond that, I'm not quite sure how useful it is. But I also looked at the number of characters. We had 93,000 characters and only 22,000 words. So interestingly, we have an aggregate information loss, apparently. If you compute based on the words, you have less information across the entire book than if you compute based on the letters. So we know that the words have more than two characters on average, probably. Didn't compute it, but probably guess that that's true. So I don't know, that's interesting. If you think about words as symbols versus the letters as symbols, we know there's some opportunity to add information into word streams because the words are not as rich with information as if you went just with the letters. But then a G zipped it as well and looked at it just as 8-bit bytes. And interestingly enough, the gzip is almost 8 bits. I mean, only, yeah, almost 8 bits of information per symbol. So when you take the story and then you gzip the thing, you do have an almost perfect amount of information stored in it. There's very little that gzip does that does not compress it appropriately and relatively randomly. I gotta take my friend home. I'm super sorry. Okay. I'm gonna comment on the thing about some thoughts that I have on the Facebook. Okay. Sounds wonderful. Uh, I wish thank I could you. say it was really good. Thank you. Sorry, I gotta take my friend home. But well, thank you for coming. Nice to meet you. Now here's a real, a real monkey wrench to throw into this thing, and it's done, of course, by design. What if? Uh, what if? you were to compare these two waveforms. We said we wanted stuff to be really noisy looking because that's where we get a lot of, uh, that's where we really like shore up the idea of having um, the information. So we would assert that some kind of real noisy, random noise looking thing would have a lot of information. But what about if you just had a sawtooth. A sawtooth gives you a perfectly even distribution. I mean, as long as you're looking at it over integer periods. So, it, curiously enough, if you look at a random waveform versus the uh, sawtooth, just to look at it, you would feel that sawtooth doesn't have a lot of information. It has a lot of repetition. So this is one area where you have to watch out using information theory because you can have two things that have wildly different characteristics to look at them. You know perfectly well that they're very different in some sense in what information they have. But if you were to compute uh, the, um, oops, if you were to compute the uh, entropy of these two things, they're actually extremely similar. And I don't know what happened to that, but. Uh, it seems that the terminal disappeared and does not want to reappear. So, if I, I don't remember exactly how many points got done, but I mean it's quite a lot, like 200 periods of the sawtooth or something and then the same number of points of just random noise. I get exactly three bits, and now that's because I have eight symbols, so eight symbols is three bits. And that's mainly because if you do much more, it doesn't print on the screen for the distributions. I've got perfect amount of information capacity for this sawtooth wave. It does not appear to be something that would contain a lot of information, and I have a reasonably good amount of information with one that's just random numbers. And that's because it's not exactly an even distribution or uniform distribution. So some things to be aware of are there's plenty of examples of data that have a lack of information, but they would have a uniform or close to uniform distribution. So 
it's not the end all tool. It's one way of looking at trends, but not the only way. And then the last thing to do is looking at this classifier. And basically what this classifier or decision tree thing does is it will uh, So we take this, this uh, stuff we want to classify. So with a decision tree, you want to be able to say, please pick this column, pick a value out of this column. Given that I picked a value out of this column, why don't you choose another column? So really one of the biggest issues is how you choose the column and then how you stop doing it. Where do you stop doing it? So uh, in this data, sky, temperature, humidity, and wind are columns that we might be interested in selecting. And the play is something you're doing, it's the result. If it's cloudy, warm, with low humidity and low winds, you would go out and play or whatever. So an idea that came upon people years ago for how you might approach this problem is you could compute this is going to be a node. So later when you choose something out of sky, you would have a, a sub-node that you would have to also compute. And this might be part of a larger problem, so it's kind of a node-based thing. But um, given that you have this node, there's a certain entropy associated with the result. And then if you pick sky, you could go through and make a weighted collection of uh, entropies. Cloudy, has only one value, entropy zero, but its frequency of occurring in sky column is, is one sixth. Rainy happens twice, so it's two sixths times whatever the entropy of those values are. Sunny happens twice, so it's two sixths times the entropy of those values. Snow happens once, and it doesn't really matter if it happened only once, the entropy zero, something with one value. So you add those things up, and there's some sort of notion of entropy for the sky column. You can do the same thing for temperature, humidity, and wind. We know what play was. It has some measure of randomness because you have an entropy for it. Sky has some notion of randomness because you have a notion of uh, entropy for it. If you compare these, especially sky, temperature, humidity, and wind, you can find which one of these, if you selected on average one of those values, would make the next level of prediction, the simplest. So what you want to do is you want to reduce entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder. So you want to reduce the entropy. So what you really want to do is you want to take the lowest entropy out of those four columns. And what usually is the case is you call the information gain the entropy of the play column minus the entropy whatever respective entropy of the column that you're questioning. And then you would pick the largest because the information gain is the opposite of the entropies. And so if you run this guy for this node, the temperature column and the wind column have the highest information gain. So they would be good candidates to first filter on. So what you would want to do is you'd want to select Really, ideally, it would be kind of nice if they did not have exactly the same value because then there would be a clear winner. But you would pick the one that has the highest information gain, and then you would make the sub-problems. You would have that one picked, and then you could look at the sub-nodes. And some of the big issues with doing these classifiers like this are the computational complexity, first off, because every time you're doing the information, I mean the entropy, you're doing something on the entirety of the column. So if you have n values in uh, n rows, you're going to do something, computing entropy is big O of n. And then you're going to do it for m columns, because you're going to have to do it for the result column and for whatever selectable columns. So your basic problem in determining what your best uh, column to use is, is big O of m n. And then you're not even done then. You're going to be doing another node level. So if you actually computed 
through all the columns, you have a problem that runs in big O of m squared n time, and that's, that's pretty slow. What is good at is n is usually pretty big, and m is usually not all that big. So at least there's that. You're not, you're not going to have like a million rows that you could select. You're going to have 100 maybe or something at the most. But you might have 10 million rows of training data. So one of the biggest things is where to stop it. Uh, this was about information stroke theory and not classifiers, so just sort of blabbering about them, not going into it. But the big problem with using information theory for classifiers is that it's not, you're going to have to have all sorts of information at your disposal to help you decide when to stop running this thing. Do you stop it? Do you go all the way to the end? Do you go to where there's no more uh, no more options that really make sense to do? Or are you going to go to something where there's just wh where do you stop? And then computing the actual uh, uh, computational cost is a little bit confusing with these sort of curious heuristics that you might use. But you do have a bound, and it's m squared n, and that's terrible. So, and also, another stumbling block is you have categorical data. If you wanted to do temperatures with degrees or something, or continuous data, you have some troubles with that because every time you reduce the problem to something that only has one result, like if you had temperatures that were accurate to a hundredth of a degree, you're not going to have very many uh, result column things if you selected one. So you're going to lose resolution and you're going to have a very hard time using information theory to do this problem. So what people generally do is put continuous data into bins like this with the low, medium, high, and whatever. But you have this additional problem. Is this the, op whatever I chose for temperatures, is it the optimal choice for low, medium, and high? So you really probably have to use these classifiers very smartly and on very good information that you really know is going to work for you if you want to have a good fit from the training data. If you have categorical data to begin with, that's probably awesome. And if you have continuous data, you might not have as good fits, and the problem is going to get very difficult very quickly. So that's all that I was going to say. There's one suggestion will actually I'll use against uh, bringing continuous data into categorical data. He's from Vanderbilt University, and he says there is a loss of information, and we actually have discovered it in our work. Uh, there is a significant loss of information if you go from if you bend the data. Means there are two schools of thought actually around this mm -hmm. for classification. So I just just tell you that uh, I can I can see it. It's a, yeah. I mean, anytime you reduce, pre, I don't know. The way I like to think of it is you're reducing precision somehow. Yeah. You had a lot of precision, and then you reduce it. And in some some methods, that might be a very good thing to do. You want to know when to turn on the heater. Well, is it greater than whatever 68 or is it not greater than 68? It doesn't, you know, you can lose a lot of information. Is it, is it higher or lower? And it works fine. But if it's something where that might be meaning, more meaningful for the result. I would like to know because, uh, you know, there are two schools of thought. And uh, in a book, one of the guys in this institution at SAMS, he actually told us to bend the information. Hmm. And when we bend it, it actually gave us. Uh, not actually, we didn't try it, but then you know, if you really don't build the information, you get different kind of uh, because you're doing feature selection. And we had like about 600 variables on a data set of about 500k, like 500k rows, and uh, to reduce it to a set of like 60 features. Now, out of the 600 features, 150 were categorical, the rest were numerical, like continuous mm -hmm. variables. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do then? Like, that's a basic problem and you know um, you might end up with really weird features like somebody who would go for a SAMS membership if he has a foreign owned vehicle or an American owned vehicle like American brand there were some weird variables uh, which came by you know uh, of the propensity for becoming a SAMS member so it was really relevant to what you're talking about how do, how do you usually solve those problems have it sort of like multi-step yeah. Treat the categorical and then do 
Uh, I can send you a paper because that is where I got introduced to mutual information and all that. Um, there is a very good paper, I, I don't remember, but I actually discussed in a brown bag. So this is really interesting. I want to know like more about it. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Talk about it further. I would too. <laughs> I, this is, as far as using like the ID3 kind of style classifiers beyond that. Well, I know that there's, oh, what's that guy's name that did ID3? I forgot what his name is, but he has some subsequent ones that deal with continuous variables. I think it basically just attempts to optimize them into categories to uh, make for the highest information gain. Like yeah. maybe at every step he... Oh, Bremen, you uh, Renan Forrest, Bremen, the Bremen guy, or uh, you're saying, uh, talking about uh, Vladimir Vapnik. Not sure. Yeah. Those two guys are pretty, uh, like, uh, big in, like Bremen did the random forest at Berkeley, you know. He's like the one who's the founder of, like, he developed the random forest at Berkeley. Mm. Yeah. It'll be fun to continue looking into this. Yeah. Do you get this, are the brown bag lunch things like a internal only thing? Ah, uh, it's pretty internal only, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we discussed cool. a lot of different things, and I was the one who presented the paper. Um, actually, it was two authors from Netherlands, and they were talking uh, majorly about. Uh, they were talking a big time about like you know um, how to actually do feature selection, which is a big problem in classification. Yeah. Well, I'd love to learn more. Yeah, I can send you the paper. I have the paper with me. Okay. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you. So that's it. I wanted to hit history a little bit because I think that's important. I mean, you know, where it comes from, and it really comes from an interesting period when television came into, a, into being. I mean, you really don't think of some of this stuff. You think it's very new, but it's, it's almost 100 years old. And uh, a little bit on the maths, a little bit on the codes, and, and that's it. So thank you. Thank you.